Good day. Today is the last day of Russia's presidential election, and it has been, as one might have expected, the um, a day when we've also had frantic noise and activity from all kinds of people. Firstly, let's talk about the activity. There's been many, many more Ukrainian missile and drone strikes on Russia's western border, more attempts apparently to infiltrate Ukrainian soldiers um, into Russia, though the number of these incursions seems to be diminishing. In its very latest update, the Russian Defense Ministry says that um, only 30 Ukrainian soldiers were eliminated in the course of these attempts, which is a low number comp when compared to what has been happening over the previous couple of days. There have been, it must be said, intense shelling by the Ukrainians of border, of border cities, Belgorod specifically. The, these, this shelling appears to have taken the form of strikes by uh, multiple launch rocket systems. Um, Russian uh, so Soviet Grad systems, um, new Czech supplied Vampir systems. It's important to stress these are all unguided rockets. They're not um, high mass type rockets. But anyway, there's been lots of rocket attacks on these Russian cities. There's also been drone attacks. Ukraine has sent fleets of drones across Western and Central Russia attempting to cause as much trouble and disturbance as it can. And, well, I have to say that as of the time of making of these, this program, um, which is midday London time, early, after, uh, early evening in Russia, these various drone attacks and missile and rocket strikes don't seem to be achieving very much. Um, it seems that no Russian village so far has actually been captured by the Ukrainians. Perhaps it's premature to say that none will be, but it's starting to look perhaps a little unlikely. And in the meantime, um, the rest of the country goes on about its life. I mean, Russia goes on about its life normally, and the presidential election continues to take place. In the meantime, um, Ukraine has suffered significant losses. I've discussed them in previous programs. The military update that the Russian Defense Ministry provided on Friday spoke about 11 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles having been lost by Ukraine in its various attempts to launch um, attacks, incursions on the border. And of course, the Russians are also claiming that they're shooting down, well, according to Putin, 95% of Ukraine's drones and most of its missiles. Now, on that figure, by the way, we did get a report a couple of days ago in the Western media that the Russians are able to jam, has successfully jammed, around 80% of Ukraine's drones. These are the FPV suicide drones used on the battlefronts. But it does look increasingly, or so it seems to me, that the Russians are becoming increasingly successful in jamming Ukraine's uh, drones. And I suspect the Russians are probably telling the truth when they say that the vast bulk of the drones and missiles don't get through. But anyway, attacks continue. Kirill Budanov, who is apparently the mastermind of this entire operation, has now issued another defiant statement saying that this operation will continue. It will continue beyond the election. There's no apparently apparent end date to it. Um, well, <laughs> that remains to be seen. I suspect that sooner or later, someone somewhere is going to tell Budanov 
that this operation has gone as far as it can and there is really no further point in persisting with it, throwing away more lives and more machines to achieve nothing of any significance. Anyway, that's what is going on in terms of the actual activity on the ground to disrupt the election. As I said, as of the time of the making of this program, that hasn't had any effect. Um, I've just seen a report that 65%, uh, that there's already been a 65% turnout in the election. Perhaps it'll go a little bit higher um, by the end of the day, but it looks as if the election has largely happened without serious disruption taking place. So, um, a frenetic attempt to disrupt the election and to create a crisis on the border, which appears to have been, at least as of the time of making the, of this video, appears to have been unsuccessful. But of course there's an awful lot else also going on. And we've had all kinds of statements and comments flying around. Macron, who, as I said, actually engaged in a significant climb down um, when he actually failed to announce a few days ago um, a French deployment in Odessa. Anyway, he's been talking constantly since then <laughs> and since his meeting with Olaf Scholz. A clear sign, in my opinion, that things did not go particularly well in that meeting with Scholz. Anyway, he continues to say that, yes, France may at some point deploy troops to Ukraine. Um, he says that France has, is you know, uniquely placed to do that because it actually possesses the capability to do this thing, to deploy troops to Ukraine. Um, I have to say, no military observer I know would agrees with him on this. But anyway, Macron says that. He also says again, however, that even though he's got the willingness and the ability to do this thing, he's not going to do it for the moment. He's um, going to hold back. France will never take offensive action. It seems that France is not going to move on its own. Um, he says that um, on the contrary, not only does he have no plans at the present time to deploy troops, French troops, to Ukraine, he wants the Russians instead to agree a ceasefire during the period of the 2024 Paris Olympics. Now, that is a particularly bizarre idea, given that what Macron wants is the Russians to agree a ceasefire, whilst those Olympics are taking place, despite the fact that the Russians are excluded from those Olympics as a result of decisions made by the International Olympic Committee. Anyway, the Russians have already uh, rubbished that idea. They're obviously not going to entertain it. So, lots from Macron. There's been some attempts, again, to rationalise his actions. There was a long piece in the Daily Telegraph that said that it, the whole issue, this, this weird behaviour on Macron's part, isn't really about deploying French troops to Ukraine. It is about asserting French leadership in Europe over Germany in military strategic matters. The French Macron have been annoyed because the Germans have supplied more military equipment to Ukraine than France itself has done, or perhaps is able to do. Um, he is also annoyed that the Germans are talking about buying weapons um, for Europe's own defence needs from the United States, rather than sourcing them from European manufacturers, which would, of course, also mean French manufacturers. And, well, Macron doesn't like anyway being overshadowed by the 
Germans on strategic matters. There's even a claim in this article by the Daily Telegraph that um, some kind of understanding supposedly exists between the Germans and the French, whereby the Germans take the lead in economic questions determining the future of Europe, and the French take the lead in foreign policy, military and strategic matters. I have to say, I think that no such understanding exists or has ever existed, and I think the Germans um, are probably quietly seething at these claims, which apparently are pouring out of the Elysee. Last but not least, we're told that all of this is a cunning exercise in strategic ambiguity by Macron, keeping the Russians guessing. Guessing about what? Um, we discussed this, Alex Christoforo and I, um, in a video we did in the, on the Duran, talking about these um, plans by Macron, or at least announced plans, or perhaps and they're not even plans, perhaps ideas to deploy French troops to Ukraine. Um, we discussed the issue, the claim that this is all about some clever plan to create strategic ambiguity. Putin has already responded. He did so in that interview he gave to Sergei Kiselyov. He made it absolutely clear that as far as the Russians are concerned, they will continue military operations as always, and that as far as they're concerned also, if French troops or Western troops ever enter Ukraine, they are combatants. The Russians will have no hesitation in attacking them. They will have no red lines in terms of combat operations against these Western troops in uh, Ukraine. And, well, there was no ambiguity at all that I could see in what Putin was saying. But anyway, people, no doubt, who want to find some logic and reason to uh, Macron's statements will no doubt find it. They will talk about strategic ambiguity. They will talk about the need to, on Macron's part to put the Germans in their place. There's even some suggestions that this is all intended to somehow enhance the appearance of Europe's autonomy from the United States. I'm not saying that some of these feverish ideas don't sometimes flit through Macron's mind. But in my opinion, what we're really seeing is an extremely conceited politician, which is what Macron is, trying to find a way to um, reassert his self-confidence after a moment of humiliation when, as I said, he clearly did have plans to try to send French troops to Ukraine and was forced to back down or back off. Anyway, so much for Macron. Um, a lot of noise, a lot of activity, in my opinion, signifying nothing. He did, by the way, also, just quickly to say, he did, again, uh, talk about the possibility of his having conversations with Putin. Um, he did, however, suggest that it would be Putin who would have to initiate those calls. To my mind, that looked like an invitation, or at least some kind of overcomplicated invitation from Macron to Putin, to, for Putin to contact him. I don't think the Russians are going to be interested at all. And I think Putin himself, like many people, is exhausted and fed up with Macron. But anyway, as I said, so much for Macron. Lots of other things going on um, in terms of the election, all declaratory, uh, long article today by Daniel Johnson in the Daily Telegraph. Turns out that Putin is not the mustachioed gentleman from the 1930s from Germany, resurrected. He is actually Stalin, resurrected. There's a long piece 
in the Daily Telegraph telling us that that's what Putin really is. He's become the new Stalin. Um, and we have uh, admittedly rather shorter, but in my opinion, rather incoherent article in The Guardian by Simon Tisdall. He tells us that the only way to end the war in Ukraine on a in a satisfactory way, satisfactory for the West, that is, is by carrying out regime change in Moscow, overthrowing Putin in, as Simon Tisdall says, some legitimate way. What that legitimate way is, of course, he doesn't explain, and I think we can just ignore that word. It's just another case that we see another demand now for outright regime change in Moscow. This, from the pages of The Guardian, which I remember once upon a time when it was the true newspaper of the actual left in Britain, strongly opposed regime change operations in various countries and spoke out against them. But anyway, that's another time. By the way, Dizzle's article, the reason it was so incoherent is because when you actually drill down into its details, in effect it admits that Ukraine cannot win the war. It refuses to acknowledge that Russia is actually winning the war. But Tizzle does accept that Ukraine is unlikely to win the war, or is unable to win the war. And he does, or so it seems to me, finally come round to the proposals of people like Richard Haas from the Council of Foreign Relations. He actually references Richard Haas in this article and says that it might have that the time might finally have come to freeze the war along the conflict line and to well he all but uh, accepts that you know the West will not make any further concessions to the Russians beyond that and he sort of insinuates that perhaps this would not be a long-term peace. Um, the odd thing about that admission, very grudging though it is, is that it also, Tisdall at the same time also concedes that at the present time there's no obvious reason to think that Vladimir Putin would agree to anything like that. So, two years late into this war, Tisdall seems to be tiptoeing towards the idea of a conflict freeze, even though he admits that Putin and the Russians won't agree to it. Anyway, those are newspaper comments, and perhaps we shouldn't waste too much time about it. There's been a statement that has been published by 56 Western aligned countries denouncing Russia's presidential election. Um, why they would want to do that? Well, I think we can all guess. There's clearly an attempt to delegitimize President Putin. But according to Dmitry Polyansky, Russia's UN ambassador, the um, Western powers spent a huge amount of time trying to strong arm countries around the world to support this statement. And in the event, the only ones that did were the 56 countries that taken together, one could say, are the collective West. The Global South, or perhaps more properly, we should call it the Global Majority, this is the phrase that is being um, increasingly used, refused to join in. And this statement has, in fact, exposed 
not the strength of the Western position over Ukraine and over the Russian presidential election, but the West's weakness, its isolation, the extent to which most of the rest of the world, in fact, all of the rest of the world, <coughs> does not agree <coughs> with the West on this issue. <coughs> anyway, there we are. Um, lots of sound and fury from the West, from Ukraine, <coughs> over the course of this presidential election in Russia. Sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, at least up to this point. Now, let's actually just say a few things about the Russian presidential election. I'm going to make one observation of my own. Those who say that the election is a foregone conclusion, that the results of the election are a foregone conclusion, are, of course, right. Everybody knows that President Putin is going to win a resounding victory in the election. Um, the vote will be overwhelmingly in his favour. So this is, in some respects, a, when people say that this isn't a real contest, they are right. But that doesn't mean that this election is not, at the same time, a general reflection of opinion in Russia. This election, which has happened at this particular point in time, is better understood as a kind of referendum in Russia on Putin himself and on Putin's decisions since February 2022. Now, I'm not going to pretend that everything that happens in this election is perfect. Well, I should say that in many other countries, it's not perfect either. And um, there have been queries about elections in certain Western countries as well, including one particularly important Western country. But I'm not going to go on into that in any detail. Every single survey of opinion that I have seen, however, confirms that in Russia, most people strongly support Putin and have strongly accepted um, his perspective on the reasons for the war and support Putin in connection with that. So it is going to be a public affirmation of support for Putin rather than a contested election. But I don't think there's any grounds to doubt, however this election is conducted, that that does reflect the public mood in Russia today. The internal attempts to disrupt the election have been very minor and very scattered. The very fact that the election across most of Russia up to this point has taken place in an orderly way again argues against strong domestic opposition within Russia to the Putin government. Now this is something that many people in the West simply deny or refuse to believe. But anybody who is familiar with the country I think can see that, and I'm going to go further, and I'm going to say that one of the primary reasons it is so is precisely because of Western policy. Western policy towards Russia over the last 30 years, ever since the Soviet Union collapsed, has been, well, one might even say almost designed to consolidate public support behind a president who is following the kind of policies and taking the sort of positions that Putin himself has been taking. In fact, and this is a point I have made many times in the past, before Russia's 
presidential election. Before the start of the special military operation, most of the criticism in Russia, most of the wider criticism that one heard directed at Putin in Russia, did not come from the very small, statistically, in percentage terms, small community of liberal activists. It came from the much larger community of people, or what might be called the na nationalist patriotic wing of Russian society, which felt that Putin was being altogether too accommodating to the West, in spite of its the West's constant pressure on Russia. So, there has been, at least in my opinion, a radical misreading of the mood in Russia, just as there's been a misreading about the economic situation in the country. I've discussed this so many times now, but suffice to say that We've had more economic statistics. I discussed them in a recent video for what has been happening at the start of this year. 4.6% growth, according to Putin, GDP growth in January. And for the record, I believe though that claim to be accurate, it is supported by all of the anecdotal and accompanying statistical evidence. Signs that inflation has now stabilised and is likely to start falling in the second quarter of this year, an admission to that effect in The Economist. So a complete misreading of the economic picture in Russia, a complete misreading of the military situation, and of course a misreading, a radical misreading of the public mood. I'll just finish by saying that I think one of the major problems is that Western observers, Western journalists in particular, talk to the wrong Russians. They spend far too much time engaging with each other and talking to Russians from the, as I said, relatively small liberal community and make little attempt to reach out and talk to other Russians from different social strata who would express quite different views. Anyway, that's what I get to say about the general situation today. I confidently expect, along with the rest of the world, that at some point this evening we will hear confirmation that President Putin has won another term as President of Russia. Had there not been a special military operation, had there not been a crisis in Ukraine, had there not been uh, the huge economic sanctions war, by the way, that might have been controversial. The last, the term, Putin's term, which has just expired, or is in the process of a few weeks of expiring, was supposed to be his last. Um, some years ago, um, the uh, Constitution was changed to enable Putin to stand for a further two terms beyond the two terms that he'd already served, and of course the third term where um, Medvedev was Prime Minister. Um, in normal conditions, an election conducted to grant Putin third term, and perhaps beyond that, a fourth term, would be very controversial. But it's not really controversial in Russia today. And again, to, re to reiterate, I think this is largely the product of Western policy. Now let's go to the situation on the battlefronts. And the first thing to say is that there is more and more news pouring in about the missile strike on Odessa. And it looks like it was enormous, and it looks like it was devastating. 
Now, I said yesterday that it seemed that a large number of top commanders, Ukrainian commanders, had been killed in this missile strike. There are reports circulating that it wasn't just top Ukrainian commanders who were killed in this missile strike, but all sorts of senior NATO military officials were also attending this meeting and that many of them have been killed also. In fact, I've seen a claim, and I want to stress it is only a claim, that up to 60 NATO officials were killed in this strike. I can't corroborate that, but that is the claim that is circulating on the, must be said, Russian part of the internet. Now, there is one thing that does make one wonder whether this claim might actually be true, and that is that the names of some of the senior NATO officials who supposedly participated in this meeting and who have supposedly been killed are now also appearing on the internet. Now, I want to stress, I don't know whether this is correct, and I am absolutely not going to mention any of these names. And one thing one has always got to be extremely careful about is that sometimes when one sees all kinds of circumstantial detail appearing that appears to corroborate information, one has to allow for the possibility that this circumstantial information that's appearing has been manufactured in order to provide apparent corroboration to this story, to this claim that NATO military officials were killed in this strike. Having said that, that information is there, it is circulating, there are reports of evacuations using aircraft and ambulances from Odessa to Romania, um, and it does look as if a very, very big strike did indeed take place. Now, there's another reason to think that something big happened as well, and that is that we now have a long article in the London Times appearing today that tells us that the British Defence Secretary, um, Grant Shapps, in a trip which he made to Kiev, um, apparently accompanied by Admiral Radikin, it was suggested that he also visit Odessa, but he decided that he would not do so, because after the Russian missile strike, um, on the previous location, the base from which the Ukrainians had been apparently operating the water drones that had been attacking the Russian naval ships. Uh, this missile strike, which happened in close pr proximity to President Zelensky and to Prime Minister, Greek Prime Minister Kostas Mitsotakis. Anyway, um, we're told that um, the British security people informed um, Shaps that Odessa is no longer safe. So we've had a couple of days ago, about a week, two weeks ago, um, an instance where Annalena Baerbock was in Odessa and she was apparently in her, her motorcade was apparently supposed to travel from Odessa to Nikolaev, the port on the Dniester River, the Dnieper River. Um, at, but it turned back after her security people spotted a Russian drone monitoring the movements of the convoy. We had the missile strike by the Russians, which destroyed the base where the um, officials, sorry, the, the technicians operating the water drones were trained and um, where they perhaps were also operating the water drones from. 
We had that missile strike happening close to Mitsotakis and to um, Zelensky. And now we've had another missile strike on a building where all the reports confirm, including Ukrainian reports, by the way, that a major military conference was underway. We know that there were Ukrainian, top Ukrainian soldiers, officials there, because there's confirmation of that from Ukraine. We've not had similar confirmation that NATO officials were there. But anyway, following that strike, we've now had a report from the London Times telling us that um, sometime before this latest strike took place, British security people had told Grand Sharps not to go to Odessa. And I can't help but think that this article in the London Times, appearing now, is partly intended to tell us that Odessa is no longer safe and that Western officials, top Western officials, therefore, must stay away. That the um, um, place has become too dangerous. And, by the way, there are also reports circulating that the Ukrainians believe that there is at least one Russian spy, or perhaps more than one Russian spy, operating in Odessa, leaking information about these meetings to the Russians, and that there is a hunt for this spy or spies underway. I have already express, expressed my ignorance about these matters, but my own belief that the Russians are obtaining information from multiple sources. And, by the way, I would add, from what I know, I actually know, about sentiment in Odessa, I would guess that if the um, Ukrainians wanted to round up everybody in Odessa who was sympathetic to the Russians and who might potentially be passing on information to them, well, they would have to round up probably a majority, probably a big majority of the population of the entire city. But anyway, I will now move on and discuss other things. A major, major strike a devastating start strike on Odessa. As I said, perhaps Western officials caught up in it and killed as well. But as I said, we're not, we haven't got confirmation of that. There are telltale signs that suggest that that might have happened. We've not had proof of that. But anyway, Western officials from now on, senior ones, apparently making the decision to stay away from Odessa. On the topic of Odessa, incidentally, it is interesting that this is the location, the place, where Macron has been talking about deploying French troops. I wonder whether another reason why Macron wanted to deploy the French troops to Odessa is because perhaps he hoped that their presence there would deter the Russians from launching these devastating missile strikes. Well, if so, we've already had the reply from the Russians. If the French troops go to Odessa, they are also targets. So there we go. Why all this attention on Odessa, by the way? Well, the short answer is because I believe and I don't think I'm alone in this, that it is the major centre, the hub of um, transportation of military equipment to Ukraine from Romania and from the West. And, of course, it's likely that there's a considerable um, operations hub there as well. Anyway... Enough of this, enough about Odessa. Let's move on to other things that are happening on the battlefronts. And information now is pouring in from the Avdeevka battlefields. This is now the real war, not the make-believe war that we've been seeing on the Russian border. Deadly though that is for those who participate in it, but the actual war. Anyway, we now have 
information pouring in from the um, battle lines in, uh, in Avdevka. And this information, most of it, comes from the Ukrainians themselves. And it confirms that the Russians are in effective control of Orlo Orlovka, one of these three villages to the west of uh, Bakhmut, where the Ukrainians have been trying to hold the Russians back. Anyway, it, it appears to be confirmed that Orlovka is essentially under Russian control, and it looks as if the Russians are also very close now, perhaps hours away from completing and securing full control of Toninka as well. Um, and there's been bitter fighting in the northern village, Berdici, but again, the report suggests that the Russians are still in control of a crossroads at the western edge of Berdici, and it looks as if Ukrainian uh, the battle for Berdici is likely to end also very soon. I would add that if Orlovka and Toninka fall, then I would have thought that Berdici becomes undefendable. I've said that already. So this information we're getting from the Ukrainians, and the fact that we're getting this from the Ukrainians, it's not just, by the way, um, um, adjustments by pro-Ukrainian mappers and tweets and things of that kind. There's also some film which um, appears to confirm, well, does confirm Russian progress in these villages. Anyway, all of that may suggest that the Ukrainians have now decided to retreat from these three villages, that they realize that these three, three villages are undefendable and that they're about to pull back from them. Now, that, as I said, opens the way for the Russians to storm uh, through various villages to the southwest of Toninka, if they choose to do so, which would seal the fate, or so it seems to me, of the Ukrainian troops that are holding out in Pervomaisky. They've apparently been pushed to the western part of Pervomaisky. And the fall of Berdici would also open the way for the Russians to advance north along the railway line towards Ocheretino, which is apparently the high ground, provides the high ground in this area. And there was a report yesterday of the Russians actually already beginning some kind of advance in this general area of Ocheretino along the railway line as well. So, anyway, it looks as if big events, big news is shortly going to come from Avdeevka. Now, yesterday, I discussed the enormous commitment to men and machines that General Sirsky had made to try to hold the line in Avdeevka. I pointed out that the Russian Defense Ministry report, one of the Russian Defense Ministry reports, spoke about units, men from 11 Ukrainian brigades participating in the fighting to the west of Avdevka. Riba, nor was it must be said the most reliable source, has actually published a further report saying that the true number of brigades, uh, Ukrainian brigades, um, located in the Avdevka area is not 11, it's 15. I can't confirm this information by Riba. It's overwhelmingly likely that these units, these uh, units are very run down. Most improbable that most of these brigades are up to strength now. One of them, the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which continues to fight around Berdici, 
it's been in continuous fighting since June 2023, when it was supposed to break through Russian defence lines um, at the time of the Ukrainian summer offensive. It's been in constant, round-the-clock fighting with only short breaks, and it is now it is now commanded by its sixth commander since June of last year. So I can't imagine that this brigade, elite brigade though it is, is in particularly good condition. I'm not going to try to give an estimate of the number of Ukrainian troops in this area, but it does seem as if a disproportionate part of the Ukrainian army has been concentrated in precisely this area by the Ukrainians. And despite that, we see that the Russians are continuing to advance. By the way, the very latest Russian Defense Ministry update about the fighting in, uh, in the area of the special military operation, the one that came out this morning, again said that Ukrainian losses over the previous 24 hours in the fighting west of Avdavka came to 400 men dead and wounded. Anyway, um, the London Times, that same article that spoke about um, Grant Shapps's inability to travel to Odessa, it has this to say um, about the fighting on the front lines at the moment. It says that the Russian meat grinder is advancing, which is one way of describing the Russian army. Um, and it goes on to say, on February 19th, Moscow said it had seized total control of Avdevka, a strategic city in Donetsk, Oblast, its first big victory since the fall of Bakhmut in May last year. I've already said this is untrue. The biggest victory the Russians have achieved since the fall of Bakhmut in May last year was not the capture of Avdevka. It was the defeat of Ukraine's summer offensive. Anyway, and the London Times then goes on to say some military experts believe Ukraine will lose the rest of the Donbass region in the months ahead. Avdevka fell... British officials say because Ukraine is being forced to ration ammunition and is struggling to get troops to the front. Both the Russian and Ukrainian forces are largely conscripts, lacking both in morale and experience. Well, that is probably true. In fact, that is definitely true of the Ukrainians. But it is not true of the Russians. As we know, there are some conscripts in the Russian military, 300,000 men were called up in the autumn of 2022. But the bulk of the forces that are fighting in, on, on the side of the Russians in Ukraine are either contract soldiers of the Russian army or they're volunteers in various volunteer formations. That's what I would say. Um, Anyway, uh, it goes on to say they're also under-equipped. Later in Kiev, I met a local working for a Western embassy who tells me he has raised thousands of pounds to buy equipment for his three friends on the front line because the army is unable to provide them with enough kit. All were civilians before the invasion. And we then go on to read, Putin has walked... Russia's economy to meet a new $140 billion defence budget, a third of the country's spending. These figures, are, as I said, they're plucked out of the air in terms of spending totals, but I, I'm not going to waste time on that. And then it admits it is now produ outproducing Ukrainian munitions at a rate of 
five to one. But of course, that also isn't true because Ukraine isn't producing munitions. The munitions that the Russians are out producing are those being produced by the West. And then we go on to read compounding matters. Kiev has been rocked by a corruption scandal involving dozens of regional officials who took bribes from men looking to escape the front line. So you see how the London Times is in effect telling us a lot of things about the situation in Ukraine. This is a journalist who's just been there, that the Ukrainian soldiers are conscripts drawn into the fort from civilian life, morale is low, equipment levels are poor, they're outgunned and outproduced, and they're facing this Russian juggernaut. But of course, he has to spike it by inserting all of these other words. Russian men, the Russian troops are also conscripts and they're also lacking in morale and training. The Russian economy is distorted, things like that. But of course, this is essentially telling us, giving us more information about how bad the situation on the front lines has become. And we are told that military experts, we're not told who these military experts are, but self-evidently they do exist, are now in effect admitting that Ukraine is likely to lose control of Donbass within months. And, well, probably on the battle lines elsewhere, things are as bad. Now, we've had very, we've had few reports from Krasnogorovka, from um, Georgievka. There were some reports from Novomikhailovka, which appear to confirm further Russian progress there. There's been a significant number of reports from the south, from Bradley Square. The latest maps, by the way, show that Bradley Square, the area to the west, to the east, rather, of Rabotino, has now shrunk significantly as the Russians have been reoccupying the fields that Ukraine captured during the summer offensive. And there's also a report that the Russians, again, are in full, and this time secure control, of 80% of Rabotino itself, implying that the battle for Rabotino now finally is about to end. Well, we'll see. There's also, by the way, reports that the Russians have now reactivated their forces in the Vremevka salient area, that they are pushing towards Staromayorsk and Urozhaina, and are intent on retaking control of those two villages, that they are also advancing towards the quite significant and historic Ukrainian town of Guilalpolye, also in uh, Zaporozhye region. All very interesting. And, by the way, there's also reports that the Russians have been quietly, quietly capturing territory in southern Donetsk region around the fortified town, the heavily fortified Ukrainian town of Vugladar. And it seems to me that this acquisition of territory around Vugladar points to a Russian military operation towards to, to capture Vugladar at some point in the next few months, once the Russians have completed the capture of um, Krasnogorovka and Pervomayorsk, and presumably Kurakovo, uh, Novo Mikhailovka, and those other villages to the north of Vuglida, and are therefore able to cut the supply lines. So we can see that this report that the Ukrainians are likely to lose Donbass before long are beginning to look like they are true. And 
we've had some other reports about the level of Ukrainian losses. There's an astonishing report in the Washington Post about the fact that there are no men left in a particular village that the reporter visited. David Sachs has written another extremely powerful, sardonic tweet about this. He says that he'd been led to believe that Ukrainian losses were only 30, 31,000 men killed. This is what Zelensky claimed about a week ago, perhaps a bit longer than that. And he said, and of course, the Sachs, David Sachs, is again being bitterly sardonic and pointing out once again to the tragedy. Obviously, if all the men in a village are, all, are gone, are dead or already wounded or in the army, then clearly Ukrainian losses must be multiples greater than the 31,000 that Zelensky has pretended. And we have also had another report, um, I, I forget in which publication, but I think it was a British one. It was the Daily Telegraph, which admits that Ukraine is about to run out of air defense missiles. We're told that Ukrainian stocks of air defense missiles are going to fall to critical levels at the end of March, that the Ukrainians will then be forced to husband their um, use of the small stock of air defense missiles that they have left, and that will enable the Russians to launch more and more missiles across Ukraine, more and more drones across Ukraine, and the Ukrainians will no longer be in a position to counter them to any significant degree. Well, that may be true. It probably is true. But of course, the Ukrainians themselves have compounded the problem through their practice, as we've seen over the last few weeks, of forward deployment of air defense systems, air defense missiles, missile systems. We've had multiple film and pictures of S-300 and Patriot launchers being destroyed near, to the, near the contact line. I saw a claim somewhere that another Patriot system has just been destroyed in Kharkiv region. But I have to say, I haven't seen any pictures of this, and the Russian Defense Ministry does not mention it in its latest update. So it may be that this report is wrong. But anyway, we can see that the problems, Ukraine's problems, are accumulating. And, well, going back to the article in the London Times, they talk about the distorted Russian economy, an economy which, as I said, has achieved 4.6% GDP growth in January this year, which, um, well, we've had figures for the budget in the first two months of this year, the Russian budget a deficit, quite low, oil prices likely to rise, so maybe we will see surplus. It's not impossible this year. No sign of the economy, the Russian economy, under any exceptional stress. And the best indicator of that is that the pressure on inflation now appears to be downward. So it looks to me as if we are now on a clear trajectory. Even people like Simon Tisdall, who's grudgingly talking about a freeze of the conflict. Richard Hass's proposal made in the spring of last year, now way out of date. And of course, Putin went out of his way to trash it 
in his interview with Sergei Kiselyov, he basically spoke about Richard Haas and called him a dangerous man, even though he was careful not to name, not to actually name Richard Haas. But anyway, Simon Tisdall talking about um, the need for a freeze, but admitting that Putin is most unlikely to agree to it. And why would he? We see the Times telling us that Donbass is soon going to fall fully under Russian control. If the Russians take control of Donbass, they will very quickly be able to reach the east bank of the Dnieper, um, opposite Dnieper. The one follows inexorably for, from the other. Putin certain to be re-elected today. The attempt to disrupt the elections. Unsuccessful? I think we can say that already. The Russian elections. Unsuccessful. Support amongst the global majority. Simply not there. And Western leaders unable to decide what to do. Schultz again talking about how the Europeans will scour the world trying to find equipment for Ukraine. Except, of course, that is proving increasingly difficult to come by. And the fact that Schultz is now talking in that way suggests to me that President Pavel's plan to find Ukraine 800,000 shells on the international arms market has already run into trouble. Well, there it is. The word out is that there can be no question of any negotiations between um, the West and Russia because un launching negotiations would undermine President Biden's prospects of re-election in November, that it would be doing that would be a U-turn too great. It would sh shatter President Biden's domestic credibility. It would be, in effect, like what happened in 1968 when President Johnson, in the face of massive protests and following the Tet Offensive, the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive, finally announced that talks between the United States and North Vietnam would begin in Paris, but was left with no option following that announcement other than to announce his decision not to seek re-election in the election, the presidential election, later that year. So, apparently, the Democrats, who probably have ancestral memories of that event, don't want to repeat. It is more important to them that President Biden run. After all, he is the only candidate, the only plausible candidate they have left, or well, plausible might be a stretch, but anyway, it is the only candidate they have left, and announcing talks with the Russians and having President Biden step down would concede the election to Donald Trump, which is something, an eventuality that must be prevented at all costs. And it seems that the Europeans also, because they don't want to understand, undermine Biden, are unwilling to initiate negotiations with the Russians also. And we see that the Russians, whilst still leaving the door for negotiations, just a little ajar, 
they're losing interest. <laughs> At least that's my own sense. Medvedev is now talking about reunion between Ukraine and Russia. He's not made clear, at least not to me, what the boundaries of this reunified state would be, what the Western boundary would be. But anyway, that's what Medvedev is saying. And Putin, in his interview with Sergei Kisilyov, spoke about the long history of Western bad faith and pointedly said that he no longer trusts anyone. So, my sense is that for the moment at least, the war must go on. Perhaps after Donbass has come under full Russian control and the Russians are on the Dnieper, and perhaps once the presidential election in the United States is out of the way, some references about talks, some moves towards talks might take place. Macron, as we see, amid all the other flurry of words that he's poured out, has said that he's open to speaking to Putin if Putin calls him. Not that, as I said, Putin shows any desire or wish to do so. But maybe towards the end of the year, something will happen like that. But by then, I fear that for Ukraine, it is too late. It will be too late. And certainly for the present, current government in Kiev, Zelensky's government in Kiev, it is already too late, Putin, in his address to the Security Council, the Russian Security Council yesterday, referred to the government in Kiev as a neo-Nazi regime, and I can't imagine that he would ever agree to negotiate with an entity he describes in that way, or countenance its survival in any form. Well, there we go. A terrible situation. One brought about by arrogance and folly and blindness. And President Macron's strategic ambiguity, as it is called, and Kirill Budanov's bloody theatrics on the Russian border change nothing. That's me for today. I hope in future programs I'll have a little more time to discuss other things that are going on around the world, uh, Middle East, uh, the Middle East situation, which is becoming, well, at the moment it seems to be stuck. The Israeli offensive in Gaza seems to be on hold for the moment, but of course there continues to be a lot of passionate talk and worry. But anyway, a situation there that seems to be um, not stable, but at least in deadlock in Gaza. Um, continued failure in unblocking the Red Sea. Um, Western ships, or at least commercial ships, still being destroyed in the Red Sea. The American military still pinned down, trying to keep the Red Sea open, still involved apparently in bomb strikes across the Middle East. Much to discuss, in other words, on that front. There were joint Russian, Chinese and Iranian naval exercises recently. Um, they're not the first in the series. This is not a new departure. But nonetheless, it is a sign of the growing closeness between these three countries, all of them now BRICS member states. As I said, a lot going on in the world, but I hope to be able to return to that, to, the, to those things in my next programme. But the epicentre of the global crisis remains Ukraine. It's about the only thing which Macron basically says, with which I agree, by the way. But anyway, 
the epicenter of the global crisis remains the conflict in Ukraine. And on that note, I'm going to end my program. Let me remind you again that um, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and Twitter X. You can uh, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also links under this video. Don't also forget also that, don't forget also that you can check out our shop where you can buy amazing things, including our St. Patrick's Day merch and all sorts of other amazing things also. We have a whole new line of sports clothes as well. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.